Well, then there's a second thing that happens as churches develop and grow naturally, and that is that there needs to be not only evangelism outward, but there needs to be encouraging, loving relationships among God's people. And so it is that God in His providence sent Barnabas, the son of encouragement, to bring into the culture of the church of Antioch encouragement coming alongside and comforting each other, challenging each other, walking side by side with each other, developing loving relationships. Because that is the mark of the true followers of Christ, according to what Jesus said, this is how people will know in the long run, you're my disciples, because you love one another. And Barnabas was sent to bring this dimension, I believe, into the church of Antioch. And so, if we don't see this happen, a church can have all kinds of new Christians and maybe even lots of people coming to Christ, but if they don't move to the next level of loving each other, then the church doesn't develop naturally. One of my favorite stories that pictures loving relationships in a church is the story of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody uh, was born in 1837 in the New England area of America. His father died when he was four years old. He was raised by his mother. At the age of 19, he had gone to a Sunday school class, and in that Sunday school class, he met a teacher, and that teacher cared about him and came to his class, his place of business. He was a seller of shoes, and he repaired shoes. And in his place of business, his Sunday school teacher led him to Jesus Christ at the age of 19. That same year he moved to the city of Chicago. He says the reason he moved to the city of Chicago is it was the place of where he could make a lot of money. So that's why he went. But in Chicago he saw a desperate need. His heart went out to all the fatherless children that were wandering the streets of Chicago. Getting into trouble having nothing to do. And D.L. Moody was sensitive to this because he grew up not having a dad. And so he did the only thing he knew to do as a Christian to try to help these kids. He gathered them together into a Sunday school class. So he gathered 18 boys into a Sunday school class and began to teach them. And over the next few years, that Sunday school class grew to 1,200 children. One day a boy was, had moved away from being near this Moody's Sunday school to another side of Chicago. But every Sunday morning he would get up, he'd walk across town. It wasn't quite as big then as it is now. But it was still a growing city and he'd go by many, many different churches. And one day a woman from one of the churches he went by came out and said to him, Hey son, you know, we have a Sunday school. It's closer to where you live. Why don't you come in and come to our Sunday school? It's just as good as any other. And the little boy said, oh, I'm sure it's good, but it's not good for me. And he, she said, well, why not? And the little boy told her, I go to Moody's Sunday school because they love a fellow over there. He could count on people who cared about him. There was an environment of loving one another that kept him walking all the way across town. So we need to ask the question, what's the glue in our church? For, for some churches, the glue is a building. 
Brother churches, the glue that keeps people together in a church is that there might be a good preacher. For other churches, it might be a good youth group. For other churches that are small, you find out that that church, the reason why everybody goes is they're all related. They all are cousins or uncles or And those are all good things. But you know, the greatest glue is loving relationships. That's what will keep people coming for a lifetime. Let's look at the third essential of natural church development and how churches grow, and that's empowering leaders. We read in Acts 11 that Barnabas was indeed an empowering leader. You know, he could have come in to to, uh, Antioch and he could have said, you know, back in Jerusalem, they never let me preach. They never let me be the leader. Now I'm coming into Antioch and I'm going to be the king in the castle. But that's not how Barnabas was. He wanted to empower God's people. He wanted to equip and support and motivate and mentor individuals to be all God could have them be. That's what empowering leadership looks like. One of my favorite stories that describes the opposite of empowering leadership is one of Aesop's fables. Supposedly there is a Greek slave who put these, who wrote these in 556 BC. And in 300 B.C., an Athenian politician gathered all these different 200 fables into a collection. And my favorite is the fable of the frogs who wished for a king. It seems the frogs were tired of governing themselves, and so they began to croak and complain against Jupiter because they didn't have a king. So one day Jupiter decided to shut him up and so he sent to the pond where the frogs were a giant log and he threw this giant log into the pond with a great splash and all the frogs were delighted and they thought, wow, we finally have this great king and what a splash he's made into our pond and they hid behind the reeds and then slowly they came out to see what king frog really looked or king uh, king log looked like but he didn't do much and so after a while the young frogs got up on the log and used him as a diving board diving platform and then the older frogs, they got up and they used him as a meeting place and continued to complain about how they had a king that didn't do anything. So then Jupiter got tired of all the complaining of the frogs and so what he did is he threw into the pond a crane. And this crane that likes to eat little animals began to go all around the pond in great pomp and circumstance. He was the opposite of King Log. He was very active and he was going here and he was going there and the frogs were delighted until all of a sudden King Crane began to eat the frogs one by one. (laughs) We need empowering leaders, not leaders who will cut us up and eat us as a meal. Empowering leaders are like Barnabas. They recruit a team of other leaders, like like Barnabas going and getting Saul of Tarsus and bringing him back. And empowering leaders work with younger leaders, as Barnabas did. He was probably much older than than, uh, Saul of Tarsus. But that's what empowering leadership looks like, working with the younger leaders to develop them, building a team of leaders so there's not just one person doing it all as the king of the castle. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God. 
please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. Let's look at the next area, and that's gift-oriented ministry. In Acts chapter 11, we read about how the church welcomed Agabus. He was a big P prophet who could predict the future by the Spirit. We're going to look more in the future. At today, I believe we have little P prophets who forth tell God's truth. They don't predict the future, but Agabus was a big P prophet. And God used him to predict a famine. And God used him to encourage his people to give to a famine that hadn't even occurred yet, to use their gifts of giving. And Agabus empowered the church to do this. Now, gift-oriented ministry means that church members know how to use their spiritual gifts. And there's an illustration here that I think is a picture of what it means to not have gift-oriented ministry. This comes from natural church development. In many ministries, nobody knows what their spiritual gift is. And so like these square wheels, they're just put onto the wagon and they're used to do different things in the church. And it's hard for them. It's not fulfilling. They're not really gifted to do it. Meanwhile, the gifts that are needed are in the wagon. They're not being used. People aren't being taught what their spiritual gifts are and being empowered to use them within the local church. People are just pressed into service without any kind of gift identification, without any kind of concerted effort to fit people with their gifts to the right place of service. We spent one whole session on Romans chapter 12, that real churches understand gift-oriented ministry. And if you haven't seen that session, I hope you'll look at it. Because there is a way that we can discover what our gift is through the passion that God's given us, through what people tell us, through the opportunities that God opens. As we do all of the different responsibilities, we begin to discover what our gift is. And gift-oriented ministry is one of the things that's necessary in a strong and growing church. 